Welcome to Different Roots Radio, where we discuss topics around lifestyle, business, and social issues. Here at Different Roots Radio, we speak with entrepreneurs from different backgrounds each week. So like, subscribe, and share to get fresh content on the regular. You are listening to Dami and Tame. It's time to boss up. DJ, you know the vibes. Cue the intro. Radio. This is Dan and me. Uh, we have another one from Guest for the Day, Michelle. Um, from the age of 16, James has held a number of positions from project manager to managing director in mostly IT roles uh, in companies such as Sky, Ben Sherman, First Group, Misguided, and most recently, the IT director of Pretty Little Thing. Currently, he has eight different businesses across Europe and Middle East. Of Middle East. Uh, with Sense Partners being the parent company of, of all of them. Uh, when this mobile piece of work, uh, he can be found boxing, partying, and driving really fast cars. So, thanks, James, for coming in. All right, thank you for the invite. Mm. So, uh, James, we, you, we're very lucky to have you in the sense that you've kind of been on the top board of a lot of companies, uh, including most recently, Pretty Little Thing. Um, how was that time there? And, you know, can you hook a brother up with some clothes for his, his missus? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it was, it kind of all happened as a uh, chance. Um, I, I, um, I've always been into IT from being really young. Um, always, always enjoyed, um, computers and, and trying to understand, uh, what makes them work. And then, um, when I was 16, um, I just turned 17. I applied for a job um, with a company in Oxford. Um, I'm from Edinburgh called Red Technology. Um, so I drove, I, I couldn't actually drive at the time, so I had to get my dad to drive me down for an interview. Also, I remember the trip because I was so ill, the, the worst cold I've ever had. I sleep for most of the journey. Um, got there, had the interview, um, didn't think of anything of it. I um, went back to Edinburgh, and then a few weeks later, I got phone calls in. You've been offered the job, and that was as a, um, a kind of project support analyst working for an e-com company. So, um, Red Technology had like a bespoke e-commerce platform um, where they had a number of um, kind of quite high-end clients: um, Hotel Chocolat, Barrows of Wilkins. Um, they did a lot of work with Delia Smith Games Workshop at the time. Um, so, yeah, it was like a, a massive um, step into the industry for me. Um, and then from there, I kind of moved up and down the UK um, to different uh, companies, some kind of uh, marketing agency, client side, um, software agency, um, around my own IT software security company in London. And then we started getting some clients in Manchester and, and then ended up working uh, working, working in Manchester for uh, Misguided and then and, and finally PLT. And that's honestly like, um to, to start so young and then to be able to climb, uh, to climb the corporate ladder, at least in different companies and getting yourself involved in all of these uh, elements. It seems like you are the kind of guy that knows a little bit about e-commerce, knows about fashion, knows about you know, telecommunications. It seems as if uh, you might be the jack of all trades in IT for different companies. Is that right? Yeah, I think with, with IT, you kind of over time learn Know, different parts and you know if, if you've not got a great knowledge of a certain area you'll slowly grow that and you know you meet people who are experts in that field and you'll speak to them and you work on a project in that area and then you'll get to understand it and slowly that that kind of grows out all the time and um, you know I'm 20, 28 now but I've been doing this now for like 11 years so. um, uh, yeah it's um, you, you slowly learn different elements of it and then everyone that you cross in the industry as well people are quite generally quite friendly and willing to, to kind of um, provide you with knowledge as well in, in the kind of specialist areas which you don't really work with on a regular basis. But today you're joining us from Dubai right? Is that correct? Yes yeah. So uh, how, how did you end up in Dubai do. from having all these companies in London and Manchester with the clients in London? <laughs> Communication barrier. So um, when I left 
PLT, I kind of decided it was uh, time to do something a bit different. Um, I, I spent five years with PLT. It was an amazing time. You know, we grew the business from 30 people to, to over 400 in head office. Um, and you know, in IT, I think there was three people in IT when I joined. Um, when I left, I had the 85 um, people working for me. Just, um, how was that? So how that take? Five years. So I think I left five years. Five years to the day that I started, actually. Um, so yeah, it was um, a, bit, a bit crazy. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. So I, I was just so. So what do you do now? Like, what do you do now? Because I know you have all these different businesses. What do you find like the most? Interesting out of all the things you do. Yeah, I'm um, I'm slightly like ADHD, so I, I can't sit still. Um, I get bored of doing things for something too long, so I end up getting involved in loads and loads of different things. So um, originally, the plan was to set up Sentio Partners, which is my consultancy company, um, and that has you know a number of clients and also supports as a backbone company all of the other businesses I get involved in. So. Um, from a graphic design point of view, from a social media perspective, from a marketing perspective, and from a software development perspective, that company provides support for all the other businesses. So we have like a core team in there of developers, designers, um, project managers, social media managers, uh, and then kind of general business support, admin functions, um, and then that's kind of where I sit and, and, and the support team that I have personally that work on the consultancy. And then slowly we've kind of been approached by people. Some some of them are clients, some of them are profit share, some of them we take equity in businesses, and some of them we've set up ourselves. So that's um, the, the kind of basis of it. And then out of that, we've, we've kind of built, built out a number of businesses. Some of those are, are finance companies, which, you know, we're doing amazingly well. Um, the personal shopping company, which we've, we've kind of founded, we've got a company that's... Um, that we're about to launch um, in the next kind of eight weeks, which does bespoke. Um, it does so so bespoke kind of vitamin pack. So you go through a, a questionnaire and it asks you questions around you know how well do you sleep, um, you know do you have any anxiety, you know how how do you how do you, how do you eat, you know how how good your meals, and then we build up a bespoke um, vitamin pack for you and, and then send that out on a on a weekly basis, of course. Um, so. I was just wondering, do you use the same, the same, every time you started one of these new ventures, do you use the same team or is it just you and then you find I different do. people to help you? I use it the same. So, um, you know, I've got a team that work underneath me. So from project management, um, kind of general business support, the same finance team that kind of pulls together the P&Ls for us and, and kind of help with the business plans. And then there's usually a, a a separate team that work within the, the actual business that we're working on that, that know a little bit more about the product. So, um, for example, on Vitamin, James Campbell, um, who's been a friend of mine um, for a while, it's you know he came to us with the idea and said you know we'd be interested in getting involved and helping with the tech program and the tech stack. And we said yeah, it kind of sits well aligned with us. Um, so he's he kind of brings the subject matter, matter expert to the, the table and and. You know, he's working with us full time. It's we can just very quickly put our support team in and get get things live. Um, I've got like a secret interest in drones. Um, I, I've never got one, but um, I read like an article I think in America last year. They had one point three million drones. Only nine hundred thousand of them are registered, and I think it's similar in the UK. We have uh, one hundred thirty thousand drones in total in the UK, but only five fifty thousand of them are registered. So I was watching this doc, yeah. doc, I think no, I actually read an article and I watched a documentary that um, all these like dodgy people using drones for different reasons. So like do drug dealers are using them to deliver drugs around England and America and also for prisons. They're using them in and out of prisons. And then like obviously Amazon are using them for deliveries and then other people are using them to spy on their neighbors. So with so many uses, do you, do you think that like drones going forward are a good thing? I remember in um, last year, there was a drone flying around Heathrow and it actually shut down the whole airport for like a day because they spotted a drone and just got a normal flight because it was a risk. So um, 
do you have any businesses involving drones and do you think everyone having a drone and like half the people or a quarter of the people not registering these drones is a problem or do you think it's inevitable and people are going to fly their drones and snoop on people and use it for whatever they want, especially with lockdown. That's why this article came because everyone was staying at home and using their drones. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've probably got six or seven myself that I've bought over the years. Um, and whether or not, um, I, I can't even think of them still. I don't even know where they are, but they definitely won't be registered. Well, what I think the latest one I bought was registered, but all the rest were before you had to register. And I think there's going to be a big problem with that. Um, the drone companies are quite good, to, from what I remember, is enforcing the registration as part of the um, software. Um, so when you when you upgrade to the latest um, operating system on the drone and on your the mobile phone, they won't let you fly unless you register. Um, so I, th I think you know the industry is doing quite a lot. Um, I, I think I think drones are great. It's, you know, it's the next step, isn't it, in, in technological evolution, really, in, in terms of removing manual labour and uh, people from the process and speed of getting something from A to B. Um, but yeah, they obviously can be dangerous. I mean, I remember I, I used to, I flew one off my balcony a couple of times um, when I lived in Manchester, um, and my neighbours complained that I was flying a drone and you know some people I think of are, are um, probably more sensitive about them than others um, in fact no one I wouldn't be too bothered um, they thought I was trying to look in the window and I was I, I stupidly threw the drone out and it was about a 50 mile an hour wind um, and I think by the time I managed to get control of, over it I put it out of my window in ankles and it was a little quick dilly by the time I managed to stabilise it so <laughs> <laughs> I was I was spending more time trying to make things that the drone didn't disappear into the into the skyline um, than just trying to look in any of the windows. But I think the um, yeah I think it's an education piece isn't it, as well around you know what they're used for and what um, what kind of cameras they've got on them and how powerful they are. I think there's lots of different versions. There's even um, there's even a security company that's trying to use drones to monitor construction sites because normally they have a guy in a hut and then. Um, they check, they drive around the site and look for intruders. But if they have a drone, they can just sit in the hut and just fly it, and it's safer for them, and they can cover more ground quicker. So there's loads of different um, applications for them. But um, do you have any ideas of using them in your businesses in the future? Ooh. In what, sorry? In, in your business, do you have any uh, plans to use drones for anything? Um, not at the moment, no. Um... But uh, obviously, if, if delivery services became available that we could, um, we could transport things to the, the drone, it would be interesting for us. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, dropping in and out like that. My internet's not that great. Um, but it, it sounds like with drones, um, with drones, a lot of people, at least in 2019, 900, almost a billion people of uh, operators. Uh, were just using it for a recreational use. So, um, but I with Amazon and with a lot of like delivery is now looking into having a lot of their uh, products being delivered by by drones or at least by unmanned uh, vehicles. It, it 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 is an industry that's actually going to be increasing. And from the sounds of it, it's, uh, we do know that according to FAA. Uh, the number of commercial drones will be doubled by 2024. So I, I can definitely see maybe James, your knowledge of drones will have to will have to be incorporated into your business. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you'll end up and everyone will end up needing to be a drone engineer. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Um, but tell me about your cars because I, I like my cars in the garage right now. My Mercedes is getting the brakes changed and the battery changed, and it's. But um, yeah, I see you've got a lot of cars on your Instagram. Um, looking very nice. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about the car industry. Is it finance? <laughs> so yeah, I got involved in the car industry. Um, I bought a, a Mercedes um, GTC um, and the company I bought it off, um, I thought it had great potential um, but needed some support from a, a business perspective. Um, so um, Sam, who owned the company, we kind of had a chat and I ended up getting involved and taking equity in that company and just providing Mostly business support um, on, the, on the back end, um, and the, the the company kind of sources and, and um, 
invites finance um, for um, for commercial and, and personal use vehicles. It's mostly PCP for some weeks. Um, and then um, following on from that, I then I've set up a separate um, business as well called um, Special Vehicle Sourcing. That's SVS, um, SVS Finance, um, and, and similar similar concept. We really got hard on um, our social presence um, with SVS, and that's kind of um, taken off in the last kind of four six weeks. So we've built up quite a good team. And working on that full time now. Um, but yeah, I've always always liked my cars, so um, yeah, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, driving and owning Lamborghinis, uh, GY Bins, GTC, GTRs, CLA 45 I had last week. Um, last, I had that last week, don't worry about that. I need a GY Bin in my life, yeah. so if you have any cheap GY Bins, yeah. I need a GY Bin. Like, that's my next car, so I'm coming to you. What are you talking you like, about? You like the GY James, I, I thought we had a deal. Like, uh, since you're in Dubai, I'll look after your cars. Keep cars nice and warm. Do you want <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's what I'm, all my friends meant to be saying. Where's where are your car? By the way, I'm like, oh, there's a garage in the garage. Oh, I'm um, So, I'm, I'm unfortunately, but I've got, um, I've kind of got rid of quite a lot of them. Um, I'm probably planning on being out in Dubai now for um, the next kind of three to six months, just due to the COVID situation in the UK. Um, a lot more relaxed out here and a bit better way of life so I'm probably going to stay here so I've kind of cut down on them and put my mum's with the dibs on the Range Rover um, so, um, right. wait, waiting for that to be delivered up to Edinburgh <laughs> <laughs> nice what's it like um, in Dubai? go like, ahead yeah I was just wondering what, what's it like in Dubai for lockdown did you have a lockdown before or is everyone just chilling by the pools or... yeah so um, originally they were quite strict here I wasn't out at the time and um, the, the kind of people weren't allowed to leave the houses. You had to ask permission. On that. You had like an app that you could request permission to leave your house, mm. and you were only allowed out once every three days. Um, and then the but they opened up uh, tourists come in uh, um, on the seventh of July, and I think I flew out on the eighth um, and spent kind of four weeks out here, um, and then I went back to the UK. It's very hot here in August. You don't really want to be around. Um, no. And spent four weeks in Spain, and then um, obviously I've come back out here. But with the the, the, the um, announcement as of yesterday, um, I think I'm probably going to stay put for a bit. It's um, you know everything's open; you can still chill around the pool. All the, the restaurants are open. Um, you know, there's no kind of curfew on um, opening times and things. So. Is that so it? Is that in I, I'm very curious to know, like you know. You, are your business meetings when you conduct your Zoom calls? Are you in the chair while everyone else is suffering <laughs> inside? Yeah, I try not. It depends who it is. Um, if it's my own team, um, sometimes I can be um, I can be around the floor a little bit more relaxed. But I tend, uh, it's hard to concentrate when you've got people around you. So I tend to, to try and uh, get on the desk and get my laptop out. All right, fair. So because uh, it, you're you're running international businesses. It seems as if you know you got to be somewhat mobile to be able to um, address different audiences in a different way. And being the buyer, I guess you figured out a way to manage businesses from abroad. Yeah, it's always hard, you know, to keep the team motivated while you're not there, and um, even hard. I mean, if, if you know we weren't, or, you know, we, we've kind of decided that our team aren't required in the office. Um, on a general basis, so most of them are now going to be working from home again, um, and it's hard to you know kind of build a team environment and motivate people when they're separate. And you know you find you don't really speak to people that often unless you need them. Um, mm-hmm. So we're trying to make sure we've got daily calls with everyone on, so we can all kind of catch up and see each other. Um, and then kind of weekly, um, I do a weekly call with each of the, the businesses, um, just to check and go through progress and make sure there's no problems. So. That's um, that's probably the hardest part for me. It's, it's you know keeping everyone motivated and, and working to, to full capacity because it is it is difficult when you're at home and you've got distractions and you know your brother's there or your mum's there or the dog's there. And it, it is difficult to sit sit there and really concentrate. I find it I find it really difficult myself. And I prefer being in the office um, when I'm working and, or I was at least outside the house. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you have a, a bit of ADHD and that, that helps you with all these different business ideas. 
Do you think that that's one of the things that's made you successful? Because when you were in school, all my classmates were given all these pills to stop from having ADHD. But do you think now that <laughs> that kind of helps you spin all the plates and you balance all your different businesses because you can focus on different things? Or do you think it's more of a hindrance to you? Yeah, I mean, I do, you know, I'll, I'll tend to start looking at my phone at seven, six, seven o'clock in the morning, Dubai time, um, and that'll go all the way through till, you know, last night until two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, and you tend to be working across loads of stuff, and I like that. I like being busy, and it helps me kind of control, my, you know, can control that urge as well when you've always got stuff on it jump in between projects I really like it but I think the biggest the biggest thing is being able to delegate um, and it's like delegation something that's it's taken me years and years to learn and being able to trust people to to do it you know do a job and not micromanage them and um, at the end of the day you know those, you know, someone knows what they're doing then they can do that job and that's the key is being able to delegate the right tasks to the right people um, and, uh, and leave them to actually get on with it sure so I guess um, so. That's kind of a good transition into like the final advice that you want to be able to give uh, fellow people that want to follow into IT and follow into your steps to be a mogul, as as uh, if I can call you that. Um, like, what kind of advice would you give young people that want to hit the mogul status and maybe potentially go through the IT realm? What what would you advise them to do? To me, I never went to university, so it was, I was always self-taught. Um, and I think, I think still people have got a lot of respect for that in the industry. You know, now, I don't know if it's just because of that fact. When I look at someone's CV, I don't know. I never look at their um, the, their exam results. I don't look at the university qualification. Um, I'm more interested in the, trying to understand the personality and the work ethic um, from what they've written in the CV. Um, because for me that's more important. Um, we can you can teach someone or someone can learn the rest of it if you've got you know the right mindset. Um, and that's always been my approach. Um, and I think you know if you're coming into the industry, definitely get involved in as much as you can. Um, don't worry if you, you know you don't qualify to, to, to go to university and study um, computer science because it doesn't really make that much difference. And there's a lot of business out there that look for young, um, you know, entrepreneurial talent in, in the IT space, whether or not that's um, through kind of uh, schemes for, um, you know, what um, we've got a couple of people on um, kind of government, um, what are they called? Subsidies? Not like a, apprenticeships. Uh, apprenticeships, there you go, that's what I'm like, yeah. Apprenticeships and you know, the you know, we'll we'll work with them as well and a lot of them say you know, they're not learning that much in the course, but they'll learn a lot more um, you know, work within the business. Um and I think um generally people I, I mean I enjoy hiring people like that because I feel um, I feel like you teach them a lot more and, and I get something out of it as well. See someone grow and, and go through the stages that I've been through, um and and kind of get exposure to clients and the lingo and, and all the workload that comes with IT and, and people kind of then work out where they want to be. Some people just start wanting to be programmers and end up being testers and some people start as testers and end up being programmers. It's, um, it, you know, there's a wide range of roles within IT but I don't think it's very well understood. Um, so if you've got someone you can speak to and they can kind of help you through the roles or um, you know, you've got any career advice that you can, you can get, it's definitely worth understanding. Because when I was at school it was well, if you want to do IT, you've got one option, and that's computer science at university. But it doesn't really go, you know, you don't really understand all the roles that sit within tech. You know, there's so many, and um, yeah, you don't really get visibility of those until afterwards. Sure. Um, before we let you go, I, w I want to ask you a quick question about IT and marketing, because I'm sure you know about, you know about GDP, GDPR and um, data yeah. protection. I was wondering, I was talking to, um, I have a client in Manchester and I was talking to my client and he's like, um, he's like a 50 year old man and he, he's in security. And so I said to him, uh, we were talking, he's like, oh, so what are you going to do now after work? I said, oh, I'm going to go play some basketball. He said, yeah, you're always playing basketball, enjoy yourself, have fun. He got home at night, he called me, he said, 
I've never in my life talked about basketball, but I went on my phone the next day I've got basketball ads, NBA ads, all these basketball ads, and the only person I've ever talked about basketball with is you. And suddenly it's all on my phone. So do you think that the security and the way that they're listening to us and all this data protection is getting a bit out of hand because anything you talk about, it can be on your Instagram adverts like two hours later. Is that not a little bit creepy? And do you, do you see this getting um, a bit like Terminator? Do you see those cybernet taking over? Or do you think this is going to be... It, it's kind of... It's going to Skynet, Skynet. Yeah. Right? Or you think it's just going to balance out and it's going to be for the best of everyone? Because I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. They're always listening. I, 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 yeah. I think um, Apple, Apple has done the recent release on the, on the latest um, operating system, which um, your phone... The, the front facing camera has a little light beside it and that comes on if any apps are using the microphone um, or the camera. Um, so you you know you know that that's been used, which is which is good. But I think it's in con you know, it's, it's, a lot of people take out of context as well. And are, are they listening to the full conversation or is it the keywords are picked up and then those keywords are logged against the profile? Is and, and and those are to me are very different things. If someone's you know profiling me as what I like and that makes adverts more relevant and the content that I see more relevant actually that makes my life easier um, and is that a problem I, I, um, I don't really feel it is obviously if they're recording listening and storing every conversation you have in the background it's a bit different um, but I, I don't think the latter is really happening um, so, so, so yeah I think We'll naturally get used, you know, more and more used to it. You know, when I was, um, when you first start looking at people, you know, tools that are profiling your bank statements and going through your transactions and then looking at what you're spending and, and where you're spending it at, you know, that's been going on for years and years and years. But because it's not as tangible as you're know, having a conversation and then um, that, then, you know, responding with with adverts then people kind of ignored it for a number of years you just make me a lot more worried thank you thanks a lot now I've got to worry about what I spend my money on all my transactions the hotels and things good to know yeah the banks the banks, the banks have been selling that uh, that data I mean it's uh, it's it's not um, on an individual user level but it's not nice but you know they've been selling that data for years to market companies to be able to target users and, and to be competitors so that's their company um that does it as that it's their core product. They have a like a um, an app which gives customers discounts, but it targeted, you know, so PLT for example could target customers that shopped with misguided. Um, mm. And the you know the way that they, they work that out is, is based on bank oh, banking um, data. Wow, did not know that. That's that's uh, interesting. To know that our we're generating data. Even unconsciously if it's, if it's just as simple as transactions or yeah. having a conversation right yeah so yeah, you buying a coffee at starbucks is generating data from something yeah so on, i know that on average on earth uh approximately every single person generates 1.7 megabytes of data per second so that's oh. that's crazy hey <laughs> yeah <no. laughs> yeah i think it's um yeah, and it'll be, you know, as more and more people move to things like Apple Pay, you know, what are Apple doing with all that data? Um, and I'm sure at some point that'll become reused as, as part of uh, a part of some sort of marketing system. So we stick with Samsung. Samsung. Yeah. <laughs> Google. Google. <laughs> Google. Good old Google. They'll never misuse my data. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there are no documentaries about that. No, Not either. at all. No. Very <laughs> scary. <laughs> Right, have, you um, the latest, have, you, have you watched the latest documentary on Netflix? The social um, dilemma. The social network. I've heard about it. No, it's, 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 no, no, not no the social new network. one. The new one came out. Social dilemma. No, I heard yeah, about it. I think, it's, I think it's called the social dilemma. I started watching yeah. it the day. What? I was doing a chance to watch it. No, like, to me, it's. It, I'm already kind of tethering off of social media. Like, Facebook, I use less and less every single month. And then Instagram yeah, is, and then you, but... yeah. So to me, it's uh, it's amazing on how on how data mining works and different ways in which we can be influenced to make our decisions, specifically with social media. But let's be honest, where we live on a digital world now, where everything is online, everything is 
uh, via uh, instant messaging and things like that. So we can't really run away from uh, av- different avenues in which companies can get to us and us to them. So, but uh, James, I I know you're running out of time. You got another appointment uh, coming up soon. But uh, before you leave, if you can just tell our users, our uh, followers. Um, how they will be able to reach out to you or your companies uh, via social media? Yes, I know. <laughs> or, <laughs> or if you want to just throw out, you know, your Twitter handle or something like that, that's fine too. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the only the only one I'm going to use is my my Instagram handle, which is uh, James uh, G McDougal, um, and that's that's probably the best way to to, to reach out. Yeah, ultimately. Um, that or um, or via my email, which is James at sensio-partners.com. Right. Great. Thanks a lot for coming in, and uh, we had a had a lot of insights coming in from you. And sorry, I wasn't able to to connect with you guys easily at for some of it. But uh, you yeah. know, we we hope that we'll be able to connect with you again in the future. Sure. No, thank you very much for my pleasure. Enjoy Dubai. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Tune in next week. Bye. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share our talks. And we will talk to you next week. One love.